fastest three hours in radio. You're with Brian Kilmeade. You have been vice president for three and a half years. Yeah. The steps that you're talking about now, why haven't you done them already? Well, first of all, we had to recover as an economy, and we have done that. I'm very proud of the work that we have done that has brought inflation down to less than 3%. The work that we have done to cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month for seniors. Donald Trump said he was going to do a number of things, including allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices. Never happened. We did it. So that is the reason why she hasn't done all these great things and created the opportunity economy, which I don't know what that means, but it's always curious uh, why she hasn't done it already, because they had to recover. What's the truth? Let's bring in David Bonson, the Bonson Group uh, CEO and founder and managing partner and author of Full-Time Work and the Meaning of Life. David, your reaction to her definition of why she hasn't done these innovative things? Whatever well, they are. Well, that's the thing is I think uh, she hasn't defined what an opportunity economy is. And if she did, it would be a very different definition than we have in the American experiment. What it means to have an aspirational society is not to tell grocery stores what they can charge. It is not to uh, give people money to buy a home. We tried all that once. It created a financial crisis. It is also not to block uh, an ally nation company from buying another U.S. company. Uh, all of her economic ideas that she's come out with so far, which are very few. It's you talking about U.S. deal? Yes. Uh, it's only about three or four things she's come out with, and all of them are against the opportunity economy. Why would she do that and expose her beliefs because she's done such a good time, she's done such a good job masking them? Why would um, she choose those to come out? I think it's because the stuff that is more severe, the Medicare for All, the New Green Deal, banning fracking, those were major policy platforms in 2020. She knows that they're all losers politically. Now she's taken a couple things. It's ironic because I'm mostly a really big supporter of a lot of President Trump's economic platform from his first term, tax cuts and deregulation regulation and pro energy. The only things she's really come out with are ripping off his stuff, which happens to be the few things I disagree with. You know, this uh the US no, deal, sales US deal, no tax on tips, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. And the other thing that he brought up is IVF. Maybe we'll get insurance to pay for it. Well, she wouldn't even go that far. I she will. You I guarantee so? you within two weeks she's yeah, gonna I guess she I guess she has attribution. Yet. She hasn't done it yet, and but what's I guess the you're negative right. to that. The negative is it's gonna cost billions of dollars, right? Uh yeah, forty thousand dollars dollars per incident. Uh, th that's more than just the economics. It's not only we can't afford it. It's just overtly against the conservative mantra uh, to the extent people believe in that family decision making idea. The notion that uh, we would force insurance companies to pay for something. We sued Barack Obama when he did that. I mean, it's just not it's not our policy. So just in terms of what the economy was and what it is. Uh, under Trump, it, it started at, he, for example, gasoline was $2.06. Uh, it ended $2.07, uh, a 0 0.50 increase, obviously. Under Biden Harris, it's now on average up 49% from what they inherited. Hotel costs up 51% from what they inherited. Airline fees up 22%. Under Biden Harris, you have an increase of 21% as relates to Groceries up 21% that probably hits home the most. These things matter. Some experts on the outside say, wait, if there's a rate cut in a couple of weeks by the Fed, this is going to whitewash all that. Well, a, a rate cut, a quarter point, maybe they do a half a point from right now, we're at five and a quarter. So the vast majority of the time, about 95% of the time since 2008, the interest rate has been 0%. Zero. And now they went all the way up to five and a quarter to come back a quarter point isn't going to move the needle in the economy very much. Uh, and, and I think that they will be down by 1% by the end of the year and then they'll be down by 2% by the end of next year. So let's say you end up with about a 3% Fed funds rate. That's a little bit more normal, a little bit more moderate. It's too tight and too high right now. It was way too low for way too many years. So, you know, getting the Fed to try to be an apolitical actor that finds the right middle. Here, the problem to me is not politics, is that you're asking the Fed to set the price of money when I would rather loaner, loaners and borrowers set that price. Here's what she said about Binomics, because she does have to straddle the line. First, she praised it for two years. Last year, we put $40 million into it. Uh, she put $40 million to advertise the success yeah. of Binomics. 
it went negative. Yeah. So they don't know what to do with it except not say it. Then when asked, listen. We created over 800,000 new manufacturing jobs, bringing business back to America. What we have done to improve the supply chain so we're not relying on foreign governments to supply American families with their basic needs, I'll say that that's good work. Well, you know, here's the problem. Okay, I I can't stand this idea that politicians create the jobs, politicians destroy the jobs. I believe bad policy hurts and good policy helps. But we are in a place where we have made a messianic view of political impact on the economy. Presidents get way too much credit. They get way too much blame. And that language of we created 800,000 jobs, she's wrong on the merit. And the number's wrong. The number's wrong. And just the idea that the politicians do it is wrong. There's all kinds of other various factors that play into this stuff. But here's what they, she would I take credit for passing CHIPS Act. Okay. Um, so they did give Intel billions of dollars. Intel laid off 15,000 people. They're in trouble. They, they gave, uh, they are requiring any company that gets CHIPS Act to do all these DEI things, all these ESG things, to have daycare on site and have racial preferences. It, it, the whole thing is a big political mess. Has we, that seriously hurt this CHIPS Act? Significantly. Significantly. A bunch of companies refuse to take it. Been very, uh, uh, discriminatory of when they are taking it. Texas Instruments is one. But the question is, why are you giving companies like Nvidia and Intel with tens of billions of dollars in net income, corporate welfare, to, to do things that they were going to be doing anyways? It's outrageous. Would they be onshoring chips without they were. incentive? They, they had spent they $20 billion to build in Arizona and Ohio way before Chips Act. Way before. So is the CHIPS Act, do you think it's still a, a work in progress? Um, I do think they're going to st- yeah, work? yeah, there's still regulatory things they're going to do to try to tweak it and make it a little bit more efficacious. But again, when you start doing this corporate welfare stuff, Brian, this is what a conservative like me goes crazy. It avoids having to answer the question of why did they move those jobs there to begin with? A 35% corporate income rate. Okay, well, she wants to take credit for jobs coming back. Ca- jobs come back when capital comes back. A trillion and a half dollars came back when they did the corporate income tax cut that President Trump did. It went from 35 to 21. 35 to 21 and repatriated so many foreign profits that were already there that were allowed to come back, pay the tax holiday, and then get that capital back in the United States. So did we see, as, because I know the pandemic hit soon yeah. after, did we see the onshoring that we thought we would see when you lengthened the... Uh, when you cut the rate, you you saw the onshoring of capital, which is what matters because the capital, but not necessarily companies. Yeah, but well, but you also saw a significant uh, change in corporate strategy around it. You're right. The pandemic interrupted because it rethought the way people are doing supply yeah. chain related issues. But the point is, no matter what anyone thinks about it, um, the first of all, the issue with China has changed a lot, and the number one uh, real economic partner now is Mexico. OK, it's not going to be Ohio or Arizona. And 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 so that has to do with just broader economic policy. But South Korea, Vietnam, Mexico, these are more uh, uh, efficacious trading partners, which we believe in. We can count on Vietnam. We've so far we can really count on South Korea. Yeah. If, okay. we, if anyone wants to run on having no trade with allies, in the United States, then uh, they will create a hoot Somali depression in the United States. I understand that. And I would say a couple of things I have heard. That it's not the, we don't have the workers to make the chips here. It, and I heard it's not glorious work. It may not be glorious work. It also doesn't require a ton of workers. It's very robotic and there's an awful lot of uh, technology and automation involved. But that's the number one thing. I tell the story thousands and thousands of times. Um, you will, uh, we can't get the workers that pass a drug test. We have a cultural problem. 3.3 million men between the ages of 25 and 35 that have left the workforce since the financial crisis. 3.3 million men. You mean you talk about 2008? Yeah, since then. We're not even talking about, uh, 60 year olds, 55 year olds. They talk about the boomers retiring. That's not what I'm referring to. That number is 14 million. 3.3 million men alone, 25 to 35 years old out of the workforce. Where, how do they make a living? How do they live? I, I, it's a big combination of different things. A lot more food stamps, a lot more bogus disability claims, a lot more transfer payments, and a lot more guys living at home. Which is more depressing than you could imagine, and especially if you factor in the numbers that would be eligible to serve in the military. That's right. Or fit enough to go in the military if they choose to do so, right. or there was ever a draft. Do you think a lot of women want to marry guys in their 30s living in their mom's couch? 
So they're not marryable. They're not employable. That feeds on itself, and it becomes right. a cultural crisis. And, uh, Eric, can we have a cut of Matthew McConaughey living at home, Terry Bradshaw's The Dad? Remember that? What was that? Failure to launch? Yeah. That was failure to launch. That was pretty good. I thought if, if Eric was at the top of his game, we would have had that. Ready to go. I did not think that you'd be uh, using that reference. Uh, but if, did he ultimately get the girl? Pete, do you know? Never you, saw it, actually. You never saw Faye to I imagine. I have to call. We have to call Terry Bradshaw when he, he's got to work, start working next week. So, oh, we got to. That's right. We got to take a time. I'm listening to the music. Is that my signal, Eric? If we were on speaking terms, I got to get out. <laughs> we have to do a simulcast with Stuart Varney in a moment. David Bonson, thanks so much. He's with the Bonson Group, knows everything, and is optimistic for America's future. Yes or no? Absolutely. Always.